Welcome to Alert and Oriented, conversations about God between friends. Join Gary Barkalow and Sam Williamson as we talk about real life with the real God, really. Several decades ago, um, there was a men's retreat that a very good friend of mine, Brent Curtis, was doing, uh, along with John Eldridge. And it was out at a friend's ranch. It was kind of the first go on this. And on one of the days, um, Brent Curtis had handed out to the men a devotional and said, listen, we're going to do a few things this afternoon. We're going to do fly fishing and hiking and rock climbing, but we're also going to give you some time with God. And so I want to encourage you to read this devotional, think through it, ponder it, pray through it. And uh, over dinner and into this evening, we're going to talk about this. And it happened to be um, Oswald Chambers' devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. And it was August 5th. Not, not the date when this happened, but it was a devotional on August 5th. And it's called The Baffling Call of God. Now, I wasn't at this men's retreat, um, but I heard everything that happened to it. and. The really hard thing that happened in this in this retreat was it was on that day when Brent handed out this this August fifth devotion from my utmost for his highest that Brent Curtis actually fell um, setting up the ropes for rock climbing for a number of guys, um, and I was so taken when I had obviously he fell to his death. Yes, they fell to his death. And so when I heard about everything that went on there, including handing this out, I read this and I thought, oh my goodness, what, what an amazing title, The Baffling Call of God, and, and read this. Really, I think for the first time I had read anything from this devotional. And, and what's astounding, one of the lines in this devotional is, there is a divinity that shapes our ends. And I hardly knew what to do with that with the death of my friend and not understanding how could this happen to him? Why would this happen to him? Um, but for years and years, I've thought about this particular devotion and there's so much in this, you know, Sam, you and I have alluded to this over the years, speaking on calling and hearing the voice of God and his work in our life. And, you know, the things behind the scenes, but, Everything about that devotional is my atmosphere is highest is amazing, but this is very core, I think, to so many things we come back and touch on, and he himself touched on in his other devotional writings. So, Gary, I I love the title, the baffling call of God. Now, you know, I tend to read the my utmost because I, I originally read it in the original language, which he wrote, you know, over a hundred years ago, and now I'm reading it in the they have it like a modern version where somebody just updated it using a current language. And that's called the bewildering call of God, which is, is good. Obviously, you know, the shock of having your friend die on the day that he hands this out at a retreat he's leading. And then him dying on that day is baffling and bewildering, bewildering. And then you connect it with the divine read that phrase again, the divine the, yeah, there's a div divinity that shapes our ends. Isn't it hard sometimes to believe that there's a good divinity shaping our ends? I mean, isn't this something that, if we're honest, <laughs> yeah, we say, how could God allow yeah. this? Yeah, well, and 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 going with that thought, right after that line, he says, a Christian is one who trusts the wits and the wisdom of God, and not his own wits. If we have a purpose of our own, it destroys the simplicity and the leisureness which ought to characterize the children of God. So the test of God in some ways is to believe that he's good and his goodness is better than what we would imagine goodness to be. His yeah. wisdom is wiser than what we imagine wisdom to be. You know, I mean, it is, it's, it's funny because in some senses I come to God because I need God, right? I mean, that's why anybody comes to God is they need God. And yet, 
in my prayer time, I'm very free to give God about advice about what needs to happen, you know, <laughs> you know and it's offer like a little a direction, <laughs> telling his parent, you know, how to drive a car. It's just, and yet there's something inside me that when something doesn't go the way I think it should, I think God is getting it wrong. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, and the, and the story I tell you and what I felt was that the wrestling over God, seriously, how can this be good? Yeah. How can this be in your wisdom, you know, your, your your plans? This this tragedy makes no sense. But then I I think about how even little things in my life, and that was a big thing, but little things in my life of why didn't this conversation go the way I wanted to go? You know, why is this thing I, I wanted to happen not happening? Um those little things are hard for me to trust in the wit and the wisdom of God. You know, I just find that very difficult as well. You know, not nearly as tragic, well, not tragic at all. But when I first met you, it's because I went on a calling retreat. I think this was in 2009. So 14 years ago, it might've been 2008, 14 or 15 years ago, I went on a calling retreat. You were there. I said, I really want to know more about calling. We met and um, we started to become friends. And I remember talking to my wife, Carla, saying, because I had been be recently, I mean, like 18 months before this, I'd been betrayed by a friend really deeply, really personally, really. And it hurt financially. I mean, it was, it was a very difficult time for me in my relationship with God. This person was a, was a Christian. And I remember saying to Carla, I don't want another friend. You know, <laughs> like I don't mm. mind getting some counsel from Gary because I want to help my calling. I want to find my calling, but I don't want another friend. And and but now I look back and I say, this was a great moment. And obviously, this is not tragic. I hope it's not tragic. Uh, but <laughs> God knew what I needed so much better than I knew what I needed. And, you know, having another friend wasn't a real hassle. It was just sort of like, I don't want this. But God's ways are, are so much better. You know, there's something about the purposes of God that I do want to align my, my life with. If I look back at my life, in the end, the best things that have happened to me are the things that God has arranged, almost always things that were not part of my plans, that mm -hmm. I did not design. And yet I can look back and say, they probably were the best things that ever happened to me. So, you know, th this is an untragic story, but I still think it's a great story. I was not looking for a friend. In fact, I didn't want a friend. And yet one of my greatest strengths now is a friendship with you that I wasn't what I, that I wasn't wanting, yeah. but it was God's purpose. Yeah. And, and as you know, I had just, um, changed paths, you know, in our life, in our ministry, leaving a ministry where it felt, it really felt like the greatest betrayal we ever experienced, same kind of a thing. And I was the same way. It's like, okay, I'm not getting burned again. You know, <laughs> exactly. You that was you, it. I'm not you, getting burnt again. That yeah. was it. Yes. And you, you can't get burned if there's no tinder, there's nothing that can burn. So I'm just going to make sure the fire ring is clear. You know? <laughs> so, and same thing. But, you know, our friendship has, you know, changed the trajectory of my life and, and so many things. And you're right there. It, it is amazing when we can look back at our life and say, I never would imagine today would have looked the way it does 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you know. And yet it does feel like, yeah, this is the life God has designed me to live with the difficulties as well as the good things, you know, again, I love the title. It's just the baffling call of God, you know? Well, and I like the two elements about it. Because the first time I heard this devotional, you were quoting it in, um, in, in, in the calling retreat that I said I attended, you know, 14 or 15 years ago. And you quote it where you say, the call of God is like the call of the sea. No one hears it except the person who has the nature of the sea in him. 
And the idea is there, there is you're saying, you know, Gary, you could have your call and I could say, well, that's sort of weird. But when you hear it from God, your heart resonates. Something inside you says, oh, my goodness, this is me. This is what I want to do. This is what God has put in me. You can say that. And to me, I don't have the call of that C in me. That's the way I heard you say it. And so the baffling call of God partly is the call that God has on your life is not necessarily the call that God has on my life, which is not necessarily the call that God has on my wife's life. You know, there's different calls that we have. That's the way I always read this until just today when I heard you tell the story of Brent Curtis. And I say, that is so much more baffling. I mean, it's it's one thing the call is mysterious. You know, why is it that something stirs my heart? And And it doesn't necessarily stir your heart. Now, the truth is, when you share what stirs your heart, it starts to stir my heart some too, because you're so excited about it. And I think when I talk about something, it stirs yours. But the reality is the call of God is both incredibly joy giving because, because, because his call is the very thing I want to do. It's like amazing. What a, what a great baffling call. But his call is also very, very scary at times where something happens and I cannot see how God could bring any good out of this whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. And that just you say that the joy is, you know, when when we touch on who we really are, we hear God speak to us about it through scripture, through another person, through a circumstance. There is that joy. There is that thing that says that was that's what I'm made for. Or maybe at least that's what I hope I'm made for, but it's really the same thing, sure, you know? Right. And yeah, and 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 you're right. When sometimes this has really changed in me. I've heard, you know, people over the years and you know, just casual conversations say, I feel like the call of God in my life is to do such and such. Or and in the early years, I would kind of hear that and I'd think, oh, that sounds silly, you know, because because I didn't resonate with it. I, I didn't understand it. I had no passion for it, desire. And and now, you know, there's just a curiosity I feel when I hear people. And 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 so I appreciate that the the voice they hear, the call of the sea happening in them, whatever that sea is for them, I'm more fascinated by it, you know, and want to help them think through it and give them the courage to follow it now. So yeah, and respect the fact that God speaks to each person individually, and I'm not the one that sees their calling, you know, and God knows that to be true, and now I'm understanding that to be true. And yet, I say this is one of the things that I was not just looking, I was not, I was not only leery of having another friendship, I was also leery of a set of people I saw in men's ministry who I felt like we're a little wacky. I don't know how else how to say this. You know, the, you, you, we've all seen some guys doing men's ministry or different kind of ministries. And we go, oh, you know, there's something good there, but there's something a little stained or something a little corrupted or something we don't like. And so I was a little leery, you know, of you, sorry. Uh, but then as I got to know you, one of the things I just loved about the noble heart and this is not, by the way, a paid advertisement, everybody, for the noble heart. This is just, you know, us sharing. But one of the things I, I think I've told you this before, but so many people have said to you or, said, or told me to tell you that the noble heart can make so much money if they just brought this calling message to the business world, to the secular business world. And you kept resisting it for two reasons, which are both about God. You know, the first is you'd say, you can't really find your calling without hearing God. And how can I say that in a secular business meeting? How can I go to a Fortune 500 company and say, let's all take some time to pray right now? You know, it's not going to work. Yeah. And secondly, you would say, it's not about us. It's about God's purpose. You know, God has put these desires in our heart. So these are God's desires. We're aligning ourselves with God. We're getting a oneness with God. And so even our calling in a certain sense isn't about us. It's about his purposes, which is a large part of what this devotional is from uh, Chambers on August 5th, I think you said it was. Yeah. Which is, it's becoming one with God's purposes. And yet, it's the very desires that God puts in, in our hearts. It's not just about me. Oh, Sam wants to, you know, be the greatest bicyclist in the world. And so that's his calling. So I can have all the 
you know, trophies on my shelves. It's not that. In some ways, God is putting a desire in my heart to see his desires filled, fulfilled. And part of the baffling purpose of God is that my heart slowly changes more and more to just want to see his purposes fulfilled for his glory, not even for my own glory, not, not for me, but for him or for you. I want to see you fulfill God's purpose in your life. Um, to me, it feels like the closer we get to the purpose of God, the less self-centered we get, the more God-centered we get, the more other-centered we get, the more we want to see his glory, his purpose intimacy with him, oneness with God. So I've always loved that about you in that I think you could have made a lot more money in the business world than doing it in the nonprofit world, Gary. <laughs> and nonprofit is probably a good description for it. Um, yeah. But I also think that's part of the baffling, baffling purpose of God is you're not doing this for the money or the trophies. You're doing this because the purpose on your heart is bringing God's purpose into other people's lives. Right. And yeah, thank you. And and you know, one of the things we've talked about, touched on in, in different settings and often is this idea that when you really are offering to others what God has given you to offer to others, and and without the motive of personal gain, um that it is humbling, not humiliating, it's humbling. It's yeah. not pride building. But it is humbling because you realize, oh my gosh, that is that was not me. That was God. And that was God's life in me. And I don't want to ever spoil that. You know, but but I do think, as we've talked about, when we fake it, when we make it up, when we make it for ourselves, that is, you know, pride building. That it that that starts to create arrogance in us. So you know, because we've heard people say, you know, this idea of walking your calling and know what God has given you and there's a calling on your life, that'll just build your pride. And I thought, no, not not the real calling of God, not the real right. life of God in you. And, you know, one of the lines he says in here, which, again, we quote often, but it's so good. Um, when he, you know, he says, it cannot be stated definitely what the call of God is to, because his call is to be in comradeship with himself for his own purposes. And and the 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 version of this, the updated language of this is, you know, the call of God is to be in friendship with him mm -hmm. and what he is after. And I thought that's and that's always been your heart. You know, no matter what we do, you come back to it's about friendship with God, mm -hmm. intimacy with God, calling a second to that, very secondary. Everything else is secondary. And that's always a, such a good reminder to me, is because it's it's easy to run with anything we get excited about or goes well, or gives us some sense of, you know, happiness or, um, or, or thanks, you know, but just this idea of out of friendship with God will flow our calling. And, uh, and, and it's, it's baffling, it becomes more clear over time, it will always be baffling completely, you know, to some extent, but it becomes more clear over time. You know, as you're saying that it reminds me, I think it's also in this devotional where Chambers says that the purpose of part of the baffling nature of the purposes of God is so often it looks like failure. Hmm. You know, he says, if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus dies and all his disciples abandon him. You know, I mean, I think that part of the reason we can't speak this message directly and completely to the world is the world has this sense that if we're walking in our calling, then, you know, we're going to have a million followers on TikTok or whatever. I've never, I've never been on TikTok, so I shouldn't use that one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the world's ideas of success and God's ideas of success are so different. You know, Jesus could have come riding on a white horse and taken on the Romans. Instead, he died on a cross, abandoned. And yet that was the greatest success in the history of the world. And in our lives, I think that part of trusting in the goodness of God is the seeming failures of our lives are probably the things that are going to give us the greatest success in our lives and bring the greatest fruit. You know, a seed must die before it can bear fruit. And 
I was, I'm encouraged when I read this particular devotional, though I love all my utmost devotionals, but I'm encouraged because I'm so quick to pass judgment on whether something succeeded or failed. And, yeah. and I'm just almost always wrong. You know, uh, a seed must fail and must die before it's going to bear fruit. And what looks like failure in the eyes of the world very often it is the sweetest success in God, in, in the spiritual eyes of God than ever. And, and I think we will come to bear that fruit in our lives. It just well, doesn't look like the world. Yeah. And Sam, I think about your fairly recent story of, you know, when you sold the house you were in and you bought this house with the goal, the dream, the desire to have a place where you could have retreats in your home, you know, to 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 share the message of intimacy with God, hearing his voice, calling, friendship, all these things, and and yet and a facility that would not disturb your family life, you know, with Carla and all, but you know, finding this place, doing a couple of retreats, and the homeowners association comes after you and says, We will not permit you to do this. You know, you could have fought them because you knew that they didn't have much ground to stand on because of their violation of other HOA policies and state policies. Yes. Yeah. And you know, you you're sensing, and you can tell more of the story, you're sensing of God say saying to you, don't let me do this. Don't say anything. You just be salt and light. Don't push this forward. Um, you know, to now the point is you've walked the HOA through one of the hardest things they have ever gone through all these families that live in that community. And, you know, now they look to you for leadership, guidance, wisdom, friendship. I mean, what an amazing story that looked like failure. Like what just happened? We moved and bought this property and not, and now we're stopped. I mean, that's, that's kind of the baffling call of God. It is. It, <laughs> no kind of about it. It's still baffling, <laughs> although I think I find more hope in it. Um, I, you know, we're talking about Chambers, so I'll say it somewhere. He or he might frequently say that that one of the things that God we tend to think of success in God's eyes is a certain set of actions. You know, I accomplish this, I accomplish this. And God's and Chambers will say, and I think God is speaking through Chambers when he says, it's really the life of God exhibited in our life. And so I do believe that I'm not as angry at people as I used to be. There's something about God in my life that's creating an atmosphere. I think of it as the modern equivalent of a to-do list that I've accomplished. I hit this goal, I wrote this book, I wrote this article, I spoke this. And I think God is saying, Sam, there's an atmosphere in your life that I want so that when people around you, they sense me, you know, the the the, the sense of God. And I don't think I ever thought about Christianity that way. I think I thought about Christianity much more the Western goal-oriented approach. And I think God is saying there is something where there's just an, a, this, there's a sweet aroma of Christ in our lives as we grow more intimate with him. And I pray that that continues to happen in our lives. Yeah. 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 It, again, it's, it, I think, as you just brought up, <clears throat> I think we fight against so much when we think about calling, a person's calling, personal calling. You know, it, it's partly the the western culture we live in it's partly the time we live in it's the world that we live in you know there's just so much and and i love the fact he just talks about there is a simplicity and leisure yes I like to that. walking with god and and i forget that you know what you could say right that's what faith and trust is supposed to look like and and as he says in there it's it's believing in trusting in the wit and wisdom of god yeah. You know, I, I I can't remember how the, the the updated version the words they use in that, but it's it's trusting in it, and that and that you know is very hard for me. I often think about the verse, right? Don't lean on your own understanding. Yeah. And I think, okay, I can't I can't neglect it because God has given me 
as his gifts of understanding some wisdom, you know, through his word primarily, and then through experiencing life with God. And I can't throw that out, but he is saying, be really careful. You ultimately have to trust in my understanding, my wit and wisdom. Yeah. You know, we've never done this, but I'm going to pray a minute. I'm going to say, Father, Gary and I want your purpose in our life. We want one, yeah. we want your purpose, which is intimacy with you. And then we want your purpose to flow through us. And I pray that for everybody reading that we all become closer to your purpose in our lives, closer to you so that uh, the aroma of Christ comes through our lives. Amen. Yeah. In Jesus amen. name. Amen. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Hey, listen, this is fun, Gary. And I look forward to doing this again with you next week. Me too. So we'll see you all next week. Thanks for listening. Please join us by following this podcast or liking it. And visit our websites, thenobleheart.com and beliefsoftheheart.com for more resources in living the eternal life with God today. You'll find articles, videos, and online classes. See you next week.